Okay, we're in Genesis chapter 1, and we're going to be studying something that uh, perhaps might seem just a, a little unusual to you at first. And that is the subject of the Earth being the first ice planet. Now here we are, uh, just about to have winter to start. I believe it's December the 21st. Uh, that's when we have the uh, winter solstice and uh, the first day of winter, supposedly, and so forth. Though it's been very cold, we've had snow and we've had ice. We're going to talk about the Earth being a total planet of ice. There was a time in the past, actually when you're talking about uh, time in relation to eternity, it hasn't been all that long ago when every single inch of the earth was frozen solid from top to bottom, from surface to core, inside and out, it was solid ice. Now the reason that I'm doing this is because of a um, controversy that's going on right now amongst Christians. It's spilling over uh, into the grace movement and it is uh, drawing the lines uh, of division between us. There are those who do not believe that the earth was an ice planet. Uh, there are those who do not believe that there was any time prior to the six days of creation and uh, that the six days of creation was, in fact, the time when God originally, initially made everything. Now, of course, there is another group that believes that God originally created and that there were only angels. Man did not exist, but all of the planets existed and angels existed, and that the angels fell before man and that man is a subsequent creation to that first angelic creation to resolve what we have named the angelic conflict. Now, the issue then is whether or not there is an interval of time between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2. These verses read, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Now, as you know, I've recently been in several churches presenting uh, both uh, the birthday of the body of Christ and the rapture of the body of Christ, and uh, the videos and the studies. But I went to this one church that was a, um, uh, a BBF stronghold, supposedly. And several of the leaders of the BBF are moving away from what is called the gap theory. And uh, here I was presenting these various truths, and many of the believers there got excited. But several of those in leadership got upset. They were more interested in me calling the earth an ice planet. And they said, with a beet red face, with veins breaking in their nose and in their eyes, they were so mad. They said, I don't read that in my Bible. And I said, well, sir, <laughs> it's in your Bible, uh, but I, I don't have the time to develop it. I mean, obviously, there's only so much time uh, and so much the seat of learning can endure uh, in any uh, given uh, session uh, of study. And you can't cover every single doctrine. I was here to cover two specific doctrines, the beginning and ending of the dispensation of grace. But uh, they seem more interested in this matter than I said that the earth was an ice planet. Now, Again, they got all upset, and uh, so I determined that uh, eventually I was going to set these things to writing, put, the, put them on tape, and be able to send them back to these people and say, here, study it for yourself. Now, uh, I had mentioned just before uh, the service of the uh, Star Wars trilogy. It uh, was Star Wars, then uh, The Empire Strikes Back, and then The Return of the Jedi. And um, all of those things, just like Star Trek, 
have significance, I think, in, in the angelic conflict. There are issues presented there. Even though they're kitty stories, even though they are fiction, there are some things that are more real than what uh, uh, some people would want to admit. Now, the second one of the two of the Star Wars trilogy has in its setting the rebels being located, guess where? On an ice planet. The whole planet was encased in ice. And that's exactly what has happened to the Earth. And we're going to prove it and show that before day one of the six-day recreation, that the Earth was in existence and it was an ice planet beforehand. And we're going to take it right from the Word of God, right from, shall we say, the horse's mouth. Now, one of the ironic things about uh, this particular issue is that both groups that are fighting about this are creationists. Both groups would absolutely disavow any association with someone who would teach evolution. The first group that we will call progressive or six-day creationists would say that God created, and we would say, yes, that's true. In this, we agree. However, this uh, Progressive group believes that it took God six days to create. And you have to think, now isn't that a little bit like theistic evolution where God planted the first seed or God, uh, God uh, generated the first uh, spark of life with lightning and then uh, there is uh, somewhat of an evolutionary uh, uh, overtone in that and that things just grew from there? Well, that's pretty much what they say, that God, instead of things just happening, happening immediately, that God created and then it took him six days to make the earth, and then on the seventh he had to rest. Poor guy, he was tired. Uh, glad he didn't take a, a year sabbatical after that, he just took one day. I'm just being facetious, of course. These uh, people, this group or camp, we will call progressive creationists. They believe that it took six days for God to create, and they would, concerning the issue of Genesis 1, 1, and 2, say that there's no interval. Nothing happened before these six days. God created, and then immediately the Holy Spirit uh, went on to create the rest. But there's a problem with that. Immediately we are met with uh, uh, something that we should think about. The Bible says, any time referring to original creation, that it was not the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, but the second person of the Trinity who did all the original creating. And yet you look in the bottom half of verse 2 here, and it says, the Spirit of God, not the Son of God, moved upon the face of the waters. There's an inconsistency immediately in, in verse 2. Well, was it the Holy Spirit? the agent of recreation, or was it the uh, second person, the Son of God, the agent of creation who did the creating? So uh, th these are indications, little hints that the writer is giving us concerning the fact of a gap. Now, whether you know it or not, you believe in the gap theory, or as I like to call it, the gap fact. We believe that there is an, in, uh, an interval of time of indeterminable length. We're not exactly sure just how long. It can allow for the geological ages, but it doesn't allow for evolution because God created everything. And just because there was a time between original creation and recreation, that doesn't mean that things evolved. In fact, evolution uh, uh, predicates getting better and better. And obviously, we're saying that the earth got what? Worse and worse. It got bad. It didn't get good. Evolution means that, that from the uh, first uh, single-celled animal uh, that was generated in the primordial sludge came from the, the fish, then the, the alligators, from the alligators, then the, the, the birds, and then the monkeys, and then the monkeys uh, swung down from the trees. And now here we are. And uh, that, of course, is the... Basis of the song, I'm no kin to the monkey. Monkey's no kin to me. I don't know about your ancestors, but mine didn't swing from a tree. So gap theorists believe in creation and not evolution. 
However, the difference in the camps is simply this. We believe in immediate creation. We believe that Jesus Christ spoke the worlds into existence. Yes, there is a let there be here in, in Genesis 1, uh, uh, 3. It starts with the let there be. But prior to that, that was the Spirit of God speaking. Prior to that, in a split second, Jesus Christ stood out on nothing and said, let there be. And for by him were all things created, whether they're visible, invisible, uh, uh, whether they're planets in heaven or the earth, where thrones, dominions, powers, and all the angels immediately in a split second came into existence, had life and form and function at the moment he spoke. Now, the others would say that it took a while, six days, for this to happen. Now then, we're going to look and prove by means of contrast which model of creation is true. And we're going to see eventually winding up at uh, the ice planet uh, concept and show that the earth was ice. Both models, according to Genesis 1, 1 and 2, must allow for ice. All right. Now, what are we going to do first? We're going to look at something known as Hebrew syntax. Now, uh, a syntax uh, here is not what you normally think of in political terms. You know, when you buy for perfume, uh, when you uh, buy alcohol, they... Uh, jack up the tax on that, and they call that a syntax uh, because it's a luxury and that sort of thing. But here syntax means the formation of a sentence, the placement of words in a sentence for understanding. Now, I had Joe Williamson to ask me a, a crossword puzzle question on hermeneutics. He said, what's hermeneutics? And he thought he was going to get me, and I said, it's the science of Bible interpretation. He said, <laughs> I thought I had one on you, but uh, no, that's, that's something I know. I had a year of it. I ought to know what it is. And that's what we're doing. We're taking a category of hermeneutics, and uh, that's Hebrew syntax. There is a certain way that the Jews place their words in a sentence by which you could tell whether a sentence was continued on or whether it was disjoined at a point and the, the thought was different, though related. Now, let's look at the bottom part of the very first page. Point number one, contrasting Hebrew syntax types. The first type, if we were going to look at this and say, and that's, that's what I had to do. There had to come a time when I had to open my Bible. I mean, really, we had to open our Bibles to study. I had to open my Bible and say, okay, now we're going to look at the syntax. And the first thing I had to do was to see what's known as a sequential construction. Does it fit? Now, what is that? Well, you take a conjunction, wow. That's what it means. When uh, the Hebrew said, wow, it wasn't, uh, <laughs> you know, amazing. Boy, that, that's great and wonderful. Wow. That meant a conjunction. But depending on the, con uh, the context, it could mean and, a continuation, or but, a separation, starting something new and different, though it's related. Now, in order to have a sequential construction, you had to have the wow plus the verb plus the noun word order. Okay? Now, there's a second thing, second rule. For the disjunctive construction, or what's known as a contrast, you had to have the conjunction, wow, plus a noun, plus a verb. All right, let's go to verse number two in Genesis and see what kind of construction it is. Because this is going to help us know whether or not the writer was continuing to comment on the same thing initially or to relate it to something else that happened. Look, the word and there is the word wow. It's mistranslated in the King James English. Now, here's something that's not mistranslated, the word order. Is it a verb or a noun or a noun and a verb? Makes all the difference as to whether that and is translated and or a but. 
And I do not understand how in the world the King James people overlooked this. And the earth, a noun, was a verb. So immediately we are confronted with the fact that the writer, uh, who, whoever it was, Moses, of course, who was writing, verse number one, wanted to relate verse 2 to what happened, but to show something different. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, but the earth was, or literally, as we'll see in just a little bit, the word uh, haya in the cow perfect means became. Not was, became. Though it was without form and void, literally it should have been translated became. So this is how it looks like in in uh, in. The Hebrew, in the beginning, God created the earth. However, or but, the earth became unformed and unfilled without form and void. It does not continue the thought of original creation, but separates it, contrasts it, and, uh, and helps us to see that he's talking about a different condition than what was originally established. Okay. Now, we're going to... Uh, Continue on here in the actual word order. Point B. We'd see then that it's a type B construction in the Hebrew. And the earth was literally means, but or however, the earth became. There is no other translation that can suffice because it requires a contrast. It requires and or wow being, being translated, not and, a continuing conjunction, but but a contrastive conjunction. So that's what it is. And is the first thing, wow. On the other hand, or however, the earth, with a definite article, heth eretz, feminine singular and noun, meaning the earth, was, and this is the Hebrew haya, and in the cow perfect singular means became. So the literal translation, as we look at it in an expanded sense, but or, or however, the earth became without form and void. Now this is, the, this is the issue because it's going to affect our model of creation. We're going to see in a little bit where the progressive people have God creating imperfectly, but becoming perfect or good. But we believe that God created perfectly from the start, and it got worse due to creature sin, the angels specifically. Now, I don't know where they came up with their model, but uh, it just doesn't fit the grammatical rules of the Hebrew. All right, now, we're going to contrast something else, a figure of speech. The Bible is full of them. And it's a study that we could spend probably the next five years on, but we won't do it. What is the first figure of speech that we're going to look at? We're going to look at what's called an anadiplosis, a redoubling or a doubling of sentence beginnings or endings or middles or what have you. Anytime you have a phrase or a word and then immediately the phrase or the word recurs, there is an X that marks the spot. Now, if you'll turn to John chapter 1, we'll get the very first X. Actually, it's in the, in the study guide, and I put it in black. I don't know if you want to uh, do this or not, but you can. As the writer intended, put an X there because he wants to draw attention to the fact that there is evidence for something here. And that evidence, of course, in John 1, verses 1 and 2, is that Jesus Christ was God in the beginning. Uh, he was not created. He wasn't made anything. He always existed as God with the Father. Verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Now, note, if you will, the correlation of terms as we have it listed here. This is how it's written. In the beginning was the Word. So you have beginning in black and the Word in black. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The same, autos, is a reference back to the Word. It's just a pronoun saying that the Word is one and the same with the guy we're talking about here. 
The same was in the beginning. And guess what you can do right there? You can take a line from in the beginning to in the beginning and the same and the word and put an X there. And you can see that John had in mind showing us that Jesus Christ was the word. He was God. He was in the beginning. He has always existed. And uh, he didn't need to become flesh, but he did. And that's verse 14, but that's another story. So type one, anadiplosis, establishes equivalence so that the condition continues on as was stated. Notice John 14, verse 11. John 14, verse 11. For the second type of anadiplosis, establishing similarity in a continuing condition. Jesus said, believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. I am and me are connected. The Father and the Father are connected, showing that essentially, in essence, I and my Father are one. Now, that's not their personality, that's their essence. Anytime God is referred to as one in Scripture, that's his essence that's being referred to. Anytime it's uh, the one of the three, that's their personality. There's difference in personality, sameness in essence. So, uh, I am, and then in the Father, the Father in me, and there's a cross there. We're, we're one in that sense. But we can do the very same thing with Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Now, please note, we're doing this for a reason. Because what we have in these two verses is an anadiplosis that draws our attention to a contrast. And it's evidence to a point. It says in verse number 17, many of you could quote this off by heart. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Faith and the word of God. There's a similarity there. There is a connection. Uh, if you're going to believe, you've got to believe in the Word of God. And uh, if uh, you've got the Word of God, then it is the creed to believe. It's your faith. And then we have the similarity, the antidiplosis, by hearing, hearing by, just a reversal of the word order, but it's the same thing. It establishes similarity. You've got to hear, and you've got to hear something specific, and that's the word, and then you've got to believe in what you hear. X marks the spot. That verse right there tells you of your salvation. All right, type three. Let's go back to Genesis 7. I like this one. It's really kind of neat. Genesis chapter 7. Remember, an anadiplosis means like endings and beginnings, a doubling of the word. Anna up again. Double, meaning... Uh, it uh, comes up again in the, in the context immediately. All right, 7, 18. The waters prevailed and were increased greatly upon the earth, and the ark went upon the face of the earth. And the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth, and all the high hills were covered under the whole heaven were, uh, that were under the whole heaven were covered. Okay, let's just put it in its anatoplosis form. And the waters prevailed, that's the start, upon the face of the earth. But the ark went upon the face of the waters. Now, what does that tell you? <laughs> that the ark was not a submarine. <laughs> here was the earth, and here were the waters, and here was the ark, you see. The anadiplosis just told us that. Now, again, it's quite obvious as you're reading, but, uh, but X is marking the spot. Don't you mistake it. Uh, it. It was not submersible. It had to stay on the top of the waters. And the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the face of the earth. Oh, yeah, but now wait one second. It's just a local flood. We're going to bump into the tops of the hills, and it's going to crush the, uh, the hull of the boat, and it's going to sink. Oh, wait one second. We've got another anadiplosis here. And the waters were upon the face of the earth, but all the high hills were covered. So what is it telling us? That the ark on the face of the waters missed the, the points of the mountains. It was so high. It was several cubits 
higher than the highest mountain on the earth so that the ark would never touch bottom, would never get a rock, a, a mountain peak, to dash it as the uh, Titanic did, the iceberg, and crush its hull. So there it is again, an X marks the spot, and it has great significance. It comes out and leaps from the text and grabs you. And you have to say, this was not a local but a universal flood, and the ark wasn't under the water, it was on top of the water, but everything from the ark below was under the water. Only those in the ark were spared. That's uh, talking about judgment. Okay, now we're in Genesis. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 1. For our significant anadiplosis, being that the very sentence structure is in a contrastive form, guess what the anadiplosis is in a contrastive form? Let's just, uh, let's just look. God, all right? Now, do you, do you say that God has life? Well, of course, he's full of life. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, Jesus Christ. God has life. Does God have structure? Absolutely. He does everything decently in order. That means that he himself has it all together internally. He is the epitome of perfect organization for a being. Uh, and uh, that's why he's God and we're not. But note the anadiplosis. In a contrasting way, which is type 3, showing a difference or a condition dissimilar, it's without form and void. God has form and function. God has life and fullness. Literally, the word void uh, means uh, lacking uh, fullness, without form, without fullness. And, and it's a contrast, but the X marks the spot. So guess what? God, who was full of form and fullness, created the earth. How would you suspect he would create the earth originally if he had form and fullness? With form, with fullness. That's what the anadiplosis is saying. God created something out of nothing. And how does God create? Well, he creates immediately. Let it be, and it was. And so the earth came forth from, from him out of non-existing materials, and it was complete and perfect as it stood when he spoke. But now, the anadiplosis contrast. This same earth became something it wasn't originally. What was that? Without form and void. It shows a disintegration of thought. It shows a definite contrast. It shows that there was something that happened between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2 that we must allow for, and that was an interval of time. Now, we're going to look at uh, another figure of speech. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 11. This figure of speech this time is going to be called a paranomasia. This is not something that you can uh, take penicillin for or aspirin for and get rid of. This is actually a figure of speech. And it is important because it's words that rhyme. The Hebrew language, the Greek language, has words just like the English language that rhyme. Uh, jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Oh, what fun it is to ride in one horse open sled. <laughs> Does that work for you? Oh, sleigh. It's rhyming words. I just did that to give you a little extra boost in your Christmas fix. Another few shopping days for Christmas, and it'll all be over. Now, God takes his word, and the Spirit of God moves his authors to put in just a little sense of humor here. He's going to put some rhyming words in here. But again, like the anadiplosis, they are a technique, a methodology to have the text to grab you. There's something important here because these words rhyme. Well, it sounds the same, but it's not the same. The sound is the same, not necessarily the sense, but the use of the two words together 
magnify or embolden or augment what is going on here. In other words, the one is going to be a commentary on the other. It's going to add to, to give us a greater understanding about what's going on. So, we're calling attention here to Genesis 11, verse 9, which says, Therefore the name of it is called Babel, because the Lord there did confound the language of all the earth. And from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. Now you'll note that uh, the three instances we're giving here are all instances of paranomasias in judgment. The word, Hebrew word for Babel is Babel. And it means confusion by mixing. But the word confounded is Balel. Now, how would you like to pronounce those real fast, close together? But that's what you had to do in order to fit it in the Hebrew text. Babel, Balel, Babel, Balel. But you can't say that five times real fast. And that, is, that was done for a reason. Why? Because it's indicative of a judgment that happened right at that point where God called it Babel because he confounded or he, he uh, um, caused confusion or the peoples of the earth to, excuse the phrase, just Babylon. And that's where we get the term. Uh, so there is a judgment there between Babel and Balel. Both mean to confuse or confound by mixing together, intermingling. Uh, so you have a, a Spanish person, a German person, a French person, an English person. All of a sudden, all are changed and speaking their own native tongue at this point, and nobody understands anybody. That's confusion. But it's, it's augmented by the fact that Babel and Balel are there. That's a paranomasia. All right? Psalms 18.7. Psalms 18, 7. Now, it doesn't say it in the English, but it's clear in the Hebrew. Verse 7, Then the earth shook and trembled. Was it Elvis who had the song, There's a Whole Lot of Shaking Going On? That's Jerry Lee Lewis. Okay. All right. So anytime I need a little, little trivia here, I know where to go. <laughs> the earth shook and trembled. Jerry Lewis, whole lot of shaking going on. Shook and trembled. But what does the Hebrew say? Shook, vitigash. Now remember, this is vitigash, wow, vitarash. It means, literally, and we translate it in English, it's shaked. And the other word means quaked. But we would say, Vitigash, wow, vitarash, vitigash, wow, vitarash. Now, do you suppose that somebody bringing a message on Psalms 18.7 who came to the point of vitigash, wow, vitarash would grab somebody's attention? Well, yeah, because it rhymes in their language. Hmm, you know, take note. That sounds the same, but it's not the same, but they're placed together in this sequence as an X marks the spot again, as a means of telling us that, that it was going back and forth and up and down, back and forth and up and down. God was really uh, just turning the whole thing upside down to, uh, to prove a point in judgment. But now we come back to Genesis 1, verse 2. And guess what we hap uh, happen to have there? A paranomasia of this sort in two words. This is the, the word here. Without form, the Hebrew tohu, and empty or void is the word bohu. Now, you read it, and it says, and the earth was without form and void. But you know what the Hebrew had to do, Hebrews had to do when they read this, if they were studying this verse? They would have to say, tohu wa bohu, tohu wa bohu. Now, again, that would perk up their ears. That sounds the same. I better be careful here. What is he saying? Tohu wa bohu. All oh, those words rhyme, but they mean different things, but they complement one another. If you do not have form on the earth, 
No life support system. No structure there. Guess what happens to all life? It dies. So you look on all the surface of the planet and guess what you don't find? Any life. There's not a tree. There's not a bird. There's not a man. There's nothing there. That is the significance of that particular uh, word order and how it's given. Those figures of speech are very, very important. And uh, again, they are designed to bring out uh, of what could be just simply a superficial reading into something that has depth. Something changed. Something was different than the original perfect form and fullness of, of the creation that God had. All right, now, let's move on then, since we're here in Genesis 1, 1 to look at some contrasting Hebrew verbs. Now, uh, I have even had some correspondence with some of the folks from the church where I had a special difficulty with regard to this on the use of the Hebrew verb bara. It is translated created there in the cow perfect. And uh, they were saying, yes, but bara can mean this, that, and the other. They said, yeah, okay. Just as different words in different settings, uh, contextual settings can mean different things, bara can mean that. But obviously, if there's nothing in the universe, and then God created, and there is something in the universe, and he uses this particular word to illustrate that fact, to show the action that's going on. This word, bara, here means out of nothing into something, cow perfect, completely. There was nothing lacking, nothing deficient, nothing that was needed when Jesus Christ originally created in a split second of time. Now, let's just... Uh, show you that when we go to some other uh, verses of Scripture. Uh, come with me to the book of Psalms. Psalms chapter 33. Here's what happened originally indicated by the word bara. It says, for he, uh, verse 6, for by the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. Verse 9, for he spake and it was done, he commanded and it stood fast. Now, if that's true, look at Psalms 90. Psalms 90. And remember, bara is the word that is being used here. Therefore, that's what that word means. And by comparing scripture with scripture, we can support it wholeheartedly. That God created at that point out of nothing. Obviously, verse 2. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hadst formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting thou art God. Here we've got a point in time for creation. Obviously, the word before here is very, very significant. All right? Now, let's go to Colossians chapter 1. The book of Colossians chapter 1. And verse number 16, for by him were all things created that are in heaven, in earth, visible, invisible, whether the thrones, dominions, principalities, powers, all things were created by him and for him, verse 17, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. It means that there was a point in time when Jesus Christ decided to create, and the word that he used from, from, from non-existing materials into something was the word bara. And in the cow perfect, it means there were non-existing materials in space. And then all of a sudden, the physical or the material universe was brought forth. But it indicates perfect form, perfect fullness. Uh, 
Every planet that could have life had life on it immediately. There was no waiting for it. Every being that was created was created perfect. Immediately they began to function. Immediately they were conscious upon their creation. And we'll take you to some other verses here later on uh, that have that uh, probably next time. But um, those that believe that there was no gap do not use bara in that fashion, but they have to if they want to be consistent. Uh, turn with me to John chapter um, John chapter uh, one. We just read some verses here, but it says, "In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The same was in the beginning." There's the antidiplosis. All things were made by Him. Ginomai. It means to be made something that it was not before. There were no materials existing, and all of a sudden. Bam, ginomai. They were made. They were brought into existence. Now, the same word was verse 14. The word was made, ginomai, flesh. Jesus Christ was not a man before. He was God before, but he was made something he was not prior. Man. And the same, the same uh, type of thing is dealt with in Genesis 1 ton, 1, 1, 1 ton. <laughs> Rin tin. I've got paranomaceous on my brain. Uh, the same thing happened. Okay, now, note coming uh, to verse number two in the book of Genesis. This is in the masculine, and anytime you've got a uh, language emphasizing the masculine, you're talking about uh, something basically, depending on the context, that is outward, complete. In the feminine, it's inward and often incomplete. Bara is in the masculine, singular. Haya, was, is in the feminine, singular. Indicating something that was inward and more incomplete. The earth became, therefore, without form and void. Now, the difference is simply this. It is something that happens after. And the reason we indicate that is that Jesus Christ created, but there were non-existing materials in space. He created the materials in their perfect form and fullness. Here, Haya indicates that there were pre-existing materials. In other words, earth had already been made. It had been existing for who knows how long. And it became at a certain time out of the existing materials imperfect. It became without form and void. It became different from what it was originally and initially. All right. Uh, let's, uh, let's go from here to uh, the contrasting models of creation. And let's go to verse 12 of Ezekiel, chapter 28. This is probably, uh, because of our time, the only thing I'm going to get to comment on before we quit. All right. Now, all of this hinges upon the tense in the Hebrew. It has a certain stem by which you can tell what tense it is. But also by the use of a word referring to probably the first creature that was created. Lucifer, the son of the morning, which simply means that he was a child of the dawn. He was there when it initially started. Uh, Jesus Christ undoubtedly made him first. And, uh, and uh, he, he was be, became into existence, he came into existence, the angels and then the planets and the morning stars sang and all the sons of God shouted for joy at the awesome display of power of original creation by Jesus Christ. And that's why Jesus Christ reminds this anointed cherub, verse 15, let's go to verse 15 our time. You were perfect in your ways from the day that you were created till iniquity was found in you. 
Now, here's where we establish our model of creation. The word perfect there is tamim, meaning completely perfect. I mean, from, from uh, the, the center to, to the surface. Again, like uh, the earth there, but it has to do, it's a genetic term, uh, actually. Everything is complete in you, or you might tr uh, translate it, entirely impeccable. You are flawless and you're faultless from the day you were created. Now, that's why we say in our model of creation, we've got one minute, I'm going to make this comment and quit, that immediate creationists, which is what we are here, believe based on this and the other things we've already shown you, that God, when he created, created perfectly. There was nothing needed, no more formation. It all was formed and fashioned when Christ spoke. But it became imperfect due to angelic sin. And that's the verse of Scripture. You were perfect, but because of your volition, you chose the route of sin. And because of that, I've got to judge you. And if I were to let you in my universe, I'm going to have to show you, I'd have to judge creation as well. That's why God, uh, that's why Adam was formed, Adam sinned. And the first thing God did after Adam sinned was to curse the, the earth around him. His environment became bad.